All right, uh, a bit of rugby for you now. Tyke Furlog is here. How are you? Good, thank you. No, literally, how are you? Everybody wants to know. Good, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, felt a bit of tightness in the hammy. Um, more of a precaution, you know. You probably don't want to stay on and risk the further injury, so. Feels good and, yeah, um, extremely hopeful for available for selection for Wales. All right, so, because... With hamstrings, it's everything from like uh, a career ender in Paul O'Connell's case uh, to it's grand in a couple of weeks, and no one ever really gets to know until you test it out again. Is that how it works? Um, yeah, I, sp- I suppose you have to. You can never count your chickens before you hatch, can they? So um, obviously you have to see how it responds to, to treatment. But you know, it was only a little bit of tightness, and grand. you know, it feels good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when that happens, three or four minutes into a game, are you like, oh balls, like I. Obviously, you, you build yourself up, it's the whole hype, and you want to test yourself against the Italian front row, and then you don't get a chance to. Yeah, a bit anticlimactic, I would have said. I probably feel sorrier for Andrew Porter having played 77 minutes. It's not overly hectic for a tight head prop, but um, it's kind of a weird one. You're probably built up all week, mentally, physically, you get to game day in three minutes, and you're out, so... Um, it is what it is, and um, does it change your preparation at all? So it doesn't happen. Like, do you have to be aware of it now that it's happened? Or you? Yeah, you probably do with the rehab, but you know, it's it's not a major issue. And as I said I'd be highly confident to being available for Wales. So um, you, know, you have to tick the boxes and make sure you're not putting yourself at risk of further injury. And um, yeah, just go through the process. Do you get to enjoy a victory when you spend 77 minutes on the bench as much as uh, everybody else seems to get to enjoy it? Uh, it's kind of a weird one. Obviously, you have you know, a responsibility to try to clear this up as quick as you can, so you, you're icing the, pretty much the whole night, really. And you're not dancing with all the rest of them then? Wherever no, I'm up. not much of a dancer. I'm more of a finger wagger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Um, so no um, perfected yeah. in the foundry over many years was it the foundry's in Carlo it was more of a stores of extra town okay, back right, in the day yeah, yeah. Um, but look you, you look after yourself as best you can so um, that means you know taking care of yourself nice and so be it yeah so it, it is a bit weird and you do feel a bit separated from everybody else who's like they've got the momentum rolling two wins from two and you're like oh balls I've got to go and take it easy tonight well yeah it's, it's the nature of the game I think there's the bigger picture if you want to you know, maybe have a few drinks and cause inflammation and extra bleeding. Yeah. Take take that risk, but I think Not you know, you're a, you're a professional at the end of the day, and you want to get on the back on the pitch, and you're hopefully getting back on the pitch in Wales, so you can't really do that. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Um, we have spoken before at Walter Walsh on the show, who uh, reckons that you and him could have been international rugby teammates, or could have played against each other uh, at intercounty level in in a bunch of different sports. Um, was he as good at rugby as we're maybe being led to believe in that? Well, he was a hell of a rugby player, to be fair. Um, he played a lot of out half for us underage, um, I suppose, with New Ross, and you know, he could boot the ball a country mile yeah. and control the game very well. Obviously, athletically, very, very strong and good body spatial awareness from the GAA. So, you know, while he would have been in sort of the very early stages of, you know, the picking up in the southeast before you get to Leinster underage squads from coming from the youth system and it's probably at a time for him where Harlan was probably taken off as well for him mm. with Kilkenny and he probably um, never fully got the shot at it that I probably would have done um, but you know if if he maybe got those chances and opportunities or and you know Harlan wasn't there it's a different conversation, maybe. Because he was saying that there was actually one day where there was a clash where um, a youth's training session had been scheduled and there was a hurling match on. He just went to the hurling match and that was kind of the end of the rugby career. And those sliding doors happen for a lot of people in sport. And yeah, it's funny how those decisions kind of... Ultimately, he's not in any way... He was an all-star, you know. Uh, things worked out for him. Yeah, I think he's doing well enough, yeah. to be fair. He's a few all Irelands in the bag, an all-star. I'm pretty sure he's not contemplating... What if I didn't do this at 16 years of age? And to prefer to Wally's top of his game, watch him in the league, and last time get bet, got beaten by Wexford in the Walsh Cup final, which is <laughs> probably a sore point for him. But 
No, he's uh, he's a top hurler to be fair to him. Yeah, and again, again, your pathway to the international team, it's not the traditional pathway, but it's good to kind of start seeing these stories emerge on a more regular basis because the first one happens and I think Shane Horgan might have been the first international to come through the youth setup, and everybody hopes that that's not going to be a, an isolated case and we're seeing it happen now every three or four years every, and even a bit more often than that. Yeah, it's probably the road less travelled and... It's probably down to the amount of coaching the schools get now where, you know, they probably come out of the schools athletically and, you know, the amount of coaching hours that go into them are, you know, massively high where, you know, in the the youth level, you know, as much as there is a huge amount of work gone in, there's a huge amount of investment into the player pathway, um, that, you know, you just can't match, match the time spent at the schools have with their players and, and the coaching available to them and that being said because of those pathways that are now set up within the the underage system in Leinster you, you, we're picking up you know talent and it's good to see them making their way into Irish under 20 squads Leinster under 20 squads and, and pushing on into the academy and, and hopefully on to further things How long does it take to actually catch up on the, the lads who have been through the school system? It's hard for me to say because I've been out of school it's my eighth year out of school, so you know, it's, how do you quantify it, really? When did you start um, feeling comfortable, I guess? I probably... It was hard for me because I left school and I probably had a massive chip on my shoulder, hadn't really touched weights properly, didn't really understand a massive amount about my body, and, you know, it takes four or five years, four years maybe. For me, I felt to get up to scratch and strength levels and... <laughs> At the durability levels and, and stuff was the like chip that. on your shoulder because you hadn't been through the school's pathway that you kind of felt like these guys it looks like it's all set up for them and you had to fight fight your way is that what the chip was yeah you probably feel like you're an underdog and you probably have you probably think certain things about lads from Dublin when you grow up in the country that when you look back now you probably think are a bit naive but at the time you firmly believed it and, and it's what drove you on and thought maybe these lads got afforded more opportunities to you and you know they thought they were better than you because you come from the country and stuff like that and I'm not saying that's the case now at all but it's, it's the way I felt back then yeah do you think that there was a benefit by the fact that you were essentially just let out there to go and play you mentioned that you didn't get into a weights program but that says to me that you weren't in a regimented system where you were being told to stand in line and do this you were just allowed to go out there and play and like essentially that's what's got you to the top essentially is the fact that you're a ball player who can play in your position very well I think you can probably argue pro or against yeah. I probably spent less time with a ball in my hand or you know tackle technique and ruck technique and line outs and scrums and you know if I look I'd say if I look back and even under 20 clips of me scrummage now you'd be you know shocked and just the level of coaching you probably get that's not, it's, tr it's through no fault of the clubs, you know, no, of the course. school system itself, yeah. you know, is... is Full-time strength and conditioning coaches, yeah. six rugby pitches, you know, and um, a, a century of tradition. Yeah, exactly, and, you know, what it probably did afford to me was, you know, I didn't have to make the decision early that I'll, I want to be a rugby player, you know, you played a lot of GAA, you maybe pick up a bit of spatial awareness, um, hand-eye coordination, and, you know, I suppose when... I left school and then I got into the sort of sub academy, into more of a, a serious training program, and into the academy. You see massive leaps in you know your physical, like uh, your your body, your skill set, and all these things are new to you. So you kind of grasp on, and you can see yourself getting better and better and better, and it's kind of exciting. It drives you on then a little bit to know that you're going to work every day and you, you're getting better. Like it's, it's an interesting one, just even on the mental element of that, that you were never kind of told that you have to become a rugby player if you need to be, if you want to be a success, you have to be a rugby player. Like, say, for example, Walter maybe was living in kind of an environment where Kilkenny hurling is the be-all and end-all, whereas you went to the same school as Kevin Doyle, Aidan O'Brien even years before that as well. So becoming a Leinster and Ireland rugby player wasn't the be-all and end-all, and potentially that lack of pressure is a huge benefit. Yeah, maybe. Uh, you probably don't think like that at the time. You think... I love playing rugby, it's great crack and probably body shape doesn't suit to play hurling or football to be fair and you had a knack of, you know, you like the physical stake and the stakes of it and you just happened that you were a decent decent clip at rugby so it kind of accelerated and fell into place for me as I started moving through the ranks. 
You are a YouTube star, though. It was a brilliant video of you uh, playing underage uh, GAA as well. I think this might be under 16. <laughs> there you go. Who's this against? Ah, oh, he's against St. Martin. That's the under 14 final. Under 14? Under oh. 14. 12 year old tag. Popping around the place with his white boots and socks up. <laughs> 12. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Had I love those boots, lads. <laughs> Furlong number three on him. All oh, right. Back. Used to take out the kickouts with the outside of my foot. <laughs> Thought I was the right fella. <laughs> but you were, that's the thing. Yeah. At 12, to have the uh, cockiness. So, so you wrote your name on them or that you could. Uh, no, do you know what? It was just get friend, the like, pro direct rugby used to bring out where you could um, personalize your boots right. with the stitching. So I thought I was Jack the Lad going around yeah. the face with my white bread. <laughs> oh, you were, it turns out. Yeah, Did you I'd, win that game? We won that game, yeah. Um, don't ask me to score now. Good win, good win for the Pirates, to be fair. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, it's interesting, though, as well, that like a lot of um, those, maybe some of your contemporaries who were told, oh, you're going to go, you're going to play for Leinster, you're going to play for Ireland, that you did have that chip, which ultimately means you have to continuously improve yourself. And that's not a bad lesson to have as a 16, 17, 18 year old picking up a sport because if you have that you never really lose it, right? I expect you're still the same person now who's like looking at your opposition and other players in your position around the world going, well, maybe he's, maybe people are saying he's better than me at the moment but that's not going to last for long. Yeah, I probably, I don't particularly target, um, oh, I want to be better than him because it's very, how do you measure it? You know, it's intangible. What you, you can control is you know, when you see yourself training or when you see yourself playing games or, you know, deep down you know yourself if you're if you're working hard as you can, if you're complacent or you know, if you're if you're doing your nuts and bolts to help the team and a lot of the stuff that maybe you can't see on the pitch, um, but deep down you know yourself and you know, that's what drives me on really and I probably had an inferiority complex coming up through the age grades and maybe there's just a little bit of, of that lingering where... Not a bad thing, I guess, is the point I'm making, that actually it's not the worst thing to have as, a, as somebody breaking into a team. No, no. It's, or would you much rather have been, would you be even further down the line now if you were like, look at me, I'm a superstar? No, I don't, I don't think, I don't think that would sit well with me. Um, or it's, it's probably just not me to be doing that sort of stuff. Um, I think it, it works for me. Uh, I think there is a degree where a small bit more confidence at times it would probably be good going going through the age grades and and playing professional rugby. But um, I suppose it's something you come to understand the who you are and just the way you work and this what works for you. Do you have that confidence now? Uh, you still have a bit of that where you, you want to get better. You don't want to fool yourself, so you're letting down your teammates. You don't read into a massive amount of things people say about you, however nice they are, because you know yourself that you've areas your Graham you want to improve on to be better. And it's just always that niggling that niggling voice inside your head saying, You need to be better at that, you need to be better at this. That that, that, that keeps me that keeps me going, that drives me on. Do you get confidence in the fact though that like if you play well, you know you're gonna be a strength for your team, that it you know, you're not there to break even, you're not there to kind of do a shift for 40, 50 minutes. It actually, if Tyke Furlong plays well, Ireland and Leinster will benefit from that. Yeah, I think because I'm a tie head prop, that means the scrum is after going well, that we have a good foundation to play off. It means, you know, I'm working hard around the pitch. I'm not, you know, being lazy and losing a few seconds here and there and I'm slow off the ground. It means, you know, our maul or line outs after going efficiently. And they're the little bits, your nuts and bolts where you get. Um, confidence out of and look I've no I'm not being a complete downer on myself you know when you have a good game yeah. or if, if you're looking at tape and you see you're after doing something well like I know I'm after doing that well you know what I mean yeah and that gives you the confidence to maybe quieten the voice or do you want that little voice there to go and, and keep oh. you getting better well, you, you're never going to play the perfect game so you're still able to see where you lose a second on the ground or you know you didn't get up and uh, move to where you're supposed to go or or hold fold or, or something like that and they're the stuff then that you can, oh, I did this well, but going into the next training session, I can just fix this up and I'll be a better player. And yeah. As as the years roll on and maybe if you look back at, just say you're playing Wales next Saturday, you look at the warm World Cup warm-up that I made my debut in and you look at the player you were then and you look at the player you were now and and uh, you can see definite improvements and, and that's that's what you get satisfaction from. 
Has there ever been a game where you've come off the pitch and you thought to yourself, right, that was close to perfect? I'd imagine maybe the All Blacks, particularly when it, at the stage of your career that, that game arrives at. Um, yeah, obviously when there's a good result and you think you played well, you're happy. And but I don't think I don't think you can you can get perfection. I think you're everyone's striving for prote- perfection and. Like some games you come off and you say you can know yourself look like I played bloody well today and you know I performed well and I helped my teammates out but um, it's probably more of a rarity I would say. And when you say there a couple of moments ago that I could have improved this or I could have improved that and you're maintaining that at the moment is there any particular things that are a constant recurrence that you're always looking at and you think that needs to get better and better and better? Yeah for me I think you know, my line speed continue consistently getting off the line. Sometimes I can find myself in midfield, and they might have a bit of shape coming at me off ten. And you know, I sit down and wait to see what they're doing, so I can make an informed decision of my tackle. But you know, if I can keep coming up there and putting pressure on my tackle selection, um, I've been working on you know when to hit up as a second man or or when to bounce out and try to get a bit with in the defensive line and um, around ruck and, and carry I'm, I'm trying to work on at the minute dropping your height and carry I feel sometimes when you're carrying the ball now you might have two defenders coming at you and in the ruck just making sure I'm really aggressive every time I read too somewhere that um, the first scrum at international level was against France was it? Um, in this was that was your first Six Nations game against France? My first yeah you came off the bench and yeah, yeah, it would have been what fourth, fifth cap, maybe or some of that. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And that um, they just did stuff that you hadn't experienced up to that point, and you're like, "What the hell is this?" Like that's kind of the whole point of being an international rugby player as well. Is you just have to, okay, I've seen this experience before. I remember it. I'm cataloging that. Yeah. So the thing you have to remember is when you're a rugby player, or especially in scrummage, and you, I can't see what you're looking at. So all I can do is feel what's happening. Obviously, you're looking down the ground. Sometimes your eyes are closed. You're pushing as hard as you can. So, you're trying to gauge all these different feelings. And the more sort of games you play, the bigger the catalogue of the feelings happen, or you, you gather a bigger catalogue. So, the next time I go out and play, and uh, sorry, then you match that feeling to the video you see after the game. So next time I preview in a scrum, I might see something that I've seen before, and I know the feeling in the scrum, so I can work to solve it. Even just kind of like how... Yeah, how so I'm moving. doing that. No, yeah, no, yeah, so it's it all... Is, yeah. I'm just doing my chest. So obviously you have a hooker here, loose head here, and where the weight's coming from, how to manage it um, and counteract it. And, and a lot of the time, like it, you're not working on your own, obviously. You're working... You know, scrummaging is one of those things where you're wholly depending on the everyone around you. Yeah, but your body shape is kind of perfect for tight head, right? That actually... Yeah. It, it's... Because um, we, we had... Um, Emma Byrne. Yeah, we had Emma Byrne in, and he was just saying that, like, the way that you're built is perfect for the tight head to lock stuff down, but also then to be a bit aggressive about stuff, no matter who's coming in, if, if you're getting crap from both sides, that actually. Yeah, it's, it's again, it's subjective, isn't it? You see New Zealand have quite tall props, um, South Africa would have tall, big props. Um, and you know, it's all shapes and sizes, to be honest with you, and it's more your technique and how you scrummage and different tie heads scrummage different ways with different some are shouldery, some are chesty, some attack an angle. I would be a chesty square scrummage and tie head. So yeah. Square on, use both shoulders, uh, with a big chest. Where you'd see some and I, I scrummage quite long with my feet. So I can sort of put downward pressure with my, my chest. Well you see some tie heads. Dan Cole, for example, from England would be if you look at the angle of his legs, it'd be more near 90 degrees, right. and he'd use more of his shoulder scrummaging. And he'd try to pop you up, is that what his... He would be keeping it down at tie head, yeah. yeah. But it's just a different way of scrummaging, and whatever works for you. What, what sort of body shape in a loose head and um, hooker do you like to see when you're coming up against him? I like it nice. Because the thing is, you, you, you train so much with our loose heads are quite square as well, so you get kind of used to a square loose head. So you see a square... Loose head coming up against you, you know what they're going to do. Yeah, you've you've more of a, a bank of feeling and yeah. vision on that, so you find that, and that that's the challenge in training. Sometimes I find when we're leading up to you know a game for Leinster or, or, or an international game where you don't want to be scrummaging against the same loose head for the full week. You need to switch it over now because you can't. Yeah, 
you can't get in um, a repetition of doing the same thing against the same fella where you need a different picture. And is there much of a difference between um, Jack McGrath and Keane Healy? Like, well, yeah. There is, yeah. Yeah, there is, yeah. It, little traits. By and large, the scrum is the same way, but then every loose head or every tie head would have their own little kinks that they do. So, I'm not, obviously, I'm not going to say... Uh, <laughs> Who's better? In case Warren Gatland here is watching and, <laughs> and finds out a few tricks. But, yeah, there is. And Dave Kikine's no different. James Cronin was an Irish camp. No different. Yeah. It's all little tricks that, you know... And that's over the course of a game is the kind of... The and story that, of the scrum. You won't say you might get a descendants for a while. The other front row started out and they find, reconfigure, talk, wait to solve it. And How important is the second row in this whole process as well? It's the massive, isn't it? So if you take, there's eight people in the scrum, your front row only make three of them. So five-eighths of your power is behind you. And if your specific one is, is obviously very important then as well because that's the direct thing that you're getting. Yeah, so they say a tie head lock is massive. Where You might see the tie head lock is traditionally the bigger man, the stronger man because I'm doing my fingers. So your scrum is against the hooker and the loose head and the tie head goes right in between. Yeah. So tie head, loose head because he's one, one side of his head covered up. So you're essentially pushing as two people. So you need someone in tie. theory you need the, the stronger man behind you. Yeah. Um, and so does it matter at the moment in the Irish camp there seems to be a fair, there's a proper competition in that second row as well? Yeah. It's a matter of being comfortable with it. I think a lot of the lads are good scrummages with good body awareness where and is yeah. Henderson or James Ryan behind you mostly? It, it would be James, um, James Ryan for France. France. James Ryan was against France. Yeah. Would you be James? Would be, a lot of his the locks. James Ryan likes being a tie head lock. He likes scrummaging. So he's a big lad. He's a big unit. To be fair yeah. to him, yeah. And um, so he tie head lock, which obviously I have a partnership with him. And you know, it's it's mad to think that you know even the smallest change in his bind or you know how much he tips forward with his shoulder can yeah. have an influence on me. It's it's like the scrummage and is is massively synchronized thing. Yeah, because obviously I think back in the day it would have been um, frequently you would kind of wait and and come back a little bit to try and get a a bit of um, imbalance and then it goes down and it's like oh it had nothing to do with us I mean we were there ref you saw us like uh, so you you have to work in concert you can't just do that on your own yeah no not that it still happens yeah. obviously but uh, yeah yeah it was no it's never the day. props fault is <laughs> yeah. it so it's the other team it was your fault look. exactly yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, it's massively synchronised and important, yeah. Are, like, getting away with dark arts in the scrum, is that a thing of the past now? A thing of the past, yeah. I used to hear, oh, my father would be saying, when he was playing rugby, different generation, different era, and he'd been saying about, you know, fellas biting ears, or the second row would, like, reach his boy and slip his boy and punch the prop in the face, but he just... Yeah, because we had Mallow I Kelly in last week, and he's. I asked him, what's the best thing a second row can do in a scrum? And he just went like this. And like, I, yeah. I, I, I presume this happened. Never seen it. <laughs> Never. Um, Not even in New Ross? Oh, maybe we used to black hard back in the day. But you were the ones you, doing it. <laughs> yeah, the Ross boys. Um, yeah, you don't really see it in the modern game. Or just, there's no place in the modern game anymore. Or even if you were to do it, you're massively risking putting your team down to 14 men, um, yeah. which is just nonsensical nowadays. Yeah, it's going to get called out again and again and again. When you were 12, playing under 14 and playing fullback with your name on your boots, did you dream of playing for the Lions and playing for Ireland? Was that like equally there or was that all about... <sighs> I just played because I liked playing sport. It didn't really matter. The hierarchy of dreams, like it wasn't that... No, I, th I think in, in the winter I always loved rugby and I always dreamed of playing for Ireland. And, to be honest with you, it probably was rugby that I always loved, but you no know, hurling and football weren't far off, and um, like I didn't have set training plans. And my father didn't take me out one-on-one -on -one coaching or anything like that. It was yeah, just go out and play and have the crack, and it kind of all fell into place for me, really. And uh, the progression seems for a lot of people on the outside to have been really quick from um, sub in the uh, World Cup warm-ups to getting the cap to getting in the Ireland team to like nailing down that place to go on the Lions tour that all kind of happened really quickly to the point where you're starting on the Lions um, it, it seems to the, the outside world that it is overnight but as you say it was kind of years in the making yeah and you spend you, like, you spend a lot of years in the academy and I had, you know, I had a few nasty injuries there that hit me out for a long time and you know at the time Leinster had you know Mike Ross obviously Pillar um, Nathan White was there 
uh, Jamie Hagan was there, Marty Moore, then me. So there's there's five Taya props. So when I was coming through the academy, I, like I never did a coaching session under Joe Smith when he was in Leinster. It's only when Matt O'Connor came in that uh, I actually co- I trained with the senior team. And I suppose you're you're plugging away there for a good while, and you have to remember, you know, Mike Ross was our starting tie head. You know, he's a hell of a scrummager. Yeah. Marty Moore was ahead of me then, and you know, two Six Nations title, good scrummager, and uh, playing really well and. You know, you have to wait your chances and, you know, when they come, I suppose you have to take them as well. And, you know, I've been lucky that way and the coaches have shown faith in me and, um, you know, Joe picked me, you know, to go to a World Cup with, you know, basically no experience to be yeah. fair. And, um, I suppose what you learn there is, you know, how the system works and what it's like to be around, you know, like to Paul O'Connell and stuff like that. And, and then you can sort of bring that into your sort of game going forward for the next few years, and then it just sort of happened. So when you get to the the Lions and the selection happens, and you're in the squad, and then you realise that actually you've got a good shot of playing, and then you get named in the team. There's no inferiority complex at that point, right? There's just a okay, let's go. This is the All Blacks at home. Yeah, you probably don't have much time to think, um, especially not in the Lions there because you know, just boom, 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 boom. It's so fast paced and go 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 and all the matches and no you just go for hell for letters it's your job let's go out and do it do you enjoy that like is that it's tough is it's, it it is tough it's if you think of a normal what, what I struggle most on the Lions tour, if you think of a normal training week for us we'll train a Saturday game we'll train Monday, Tuesday Thursday, Friday Wednesday off Sunday off and in those Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday sessions, or Thursday session, not Friday, but we'll be, we train 15 on 15. We'll have 30 lads on the pitch and we'll be running through simulations and situations and stuff like that. But the line story, you rarely had it because there was two teams playing. and Just your whole build-up and preparation to big games yeah. was, was totally different to what you were used to. And even in your down day, usually when you chill out and relax and just unwind a bit. You were travelling, you were packing bags, you were heading on an airplane, you were getting to a new hotel, new roommate, unpacking bags and Yeah. It's just it's it's very full on. There's a lot of work involved and um that being said, like the camaraderie between the team and everything you experience and you know, you're fighting against what well, seems like everything against your chances of winning. And you're you're fighting against them and um you know, that's that's the pleasing bit. Do you remember minutes or moments from the games at all? Like, is, are you somebody who actually kind of thinks, right, there's 74 minutes gone here, we're playing against the world champions, we're going to beat them. Is, are there any of that? Like, do you remember? Yeah, no, not really. I think sometimes I look back, or when you're in the game, it's just happening around you, and a lot of time you're just reacting to what happens. Yeah. I guess uh, you have to be for to be in a flow state. Otherwise, you're like, oh Jesus. Oops, yeah, you, pr- you, that. you probably don't get to sit back and, and take much in or think about stuff. And I suppose in my position, I'm just doing my job. I don't have to really worry about, you know, how's the flow of this game going? Do I do we need to pin them back here? Like a ten or a game manager or nine would have to do. So, you know, I'm just focusing on you know doing what I have to do and probably not worrying about a whole lot else. And and. Um, so, because of that, when you look back at the game, you're like, geez, when did that happen? Yeah. Or it's you can't remember that. The first time a, a bit. Yeah, some yeah. of it, because you have to remember half time when I'm rucking out, I'm on the ground anyway, so I don't see what's happening behind me. So, yeah. um, sometimes when you're watching back a game, you, <laughs> you see a different game sometimes. Yeah, and from that Lions tour, like, what will your overriding memory be? And what's that full time whistle like? I, d- I suppose the full time whistle was what the hell do we do here? Who lifts the cup? Or how is this working out? And Penalties. <laughs> yeah. It's, what happens here? And, um, you know, you're so close yet so far. And, and not, you know, you draw with New Zealand. It's, well, if you ask the probably public when you, before you went out, it, I'd say most would have taken it. But, you know, as a player, it's so close yet so far away. And um, I suppose my abiding memory from it would be... Um, it's probably more off the pitch with the lads and, um, you know, just bonding and meeting new people and having the crack and sharing ideas and, you know, they're the sort of special memories that you, you'll remember. Yeah. Who was your best mate out of the Ireland cohort in that tour? Uh, best mate? I suppose I got on well with quite well with Sinks, uh, Kyle Sinkler, um, 
a funny guy. Um, there was a few others. I got on with Mako Vinopola to, uh, and Tadafaki Tulupa Felato as well. Uh, they were good guys, good crack, and you know they're always bouncing around the place and a bit of messing and stuff. So I enjoyed that. And come the Six Nations, now you have to go and try and kill them. Yeah, if I know Toby's uh, nursing a bit of injury, so I don't know if he'll be available or not. But um, yeah, that's that's the beauty of sport, isn't it? And I suppose you, you kind of used to we play. We're so close to the other provinces, but then the players in other provinces, but then you go out and try to kill him in a derby match as well. So, yeah. um, it's n- there's nothing unusual there. Well, you got any downtime or any, any time away from the... Because the Six Nations now, we're in it, and it, it feels a bit crazy, and everybody's rolling at the moment, and the fans are definitely believing that this is our year to do the Grand Slam. I realise I'm not allowed to mention that in front of any of the players, but um, like, do you get a, a chance to just go away and not be thinking about rugby for a while? You try your best to... Like, Today's a down day. We're obviously in Athlone until Thursday, so you have a, a sort of a long weekend there. And you know, it, it's encouraged that you know when we're in, we're on. And you know, when you're away, you know you're trying to mentally refresh because you know it is tough. And you know, international rugby is tough physically, but it's also incredibly tough mentally. And um, you know, it's important to get that sort of refreshment in. And you know, sometimes it's, it's easier said than done. Where you know the games in the back of your mind are something you want to improve on is on the back of your mind but you know you try your best to do it and are you doing that watching sport are you doing that like how do you how do you switch off depends really I, I, I I'd like to be alone I'd like to you know not talk to anyone um, and just do my own thing potter around or you know watch a TV series or just do something like that or I'd like to go home and, and see my family and friends around Wexford and you know my girlfriend and um, just completely unwind where you know you're not going to get too many questions or yeah. you know they know you they're not yeah. going to play blast you or they know if you want to be left alone they'll leave you alone yeah well listen thanks very much for uh, joining us um, it's been a, a remarkable ride so far but it feels like there's uh, like a fairly serious significant chapter still to be written in this yeah I hope so and you know luckily I've been uh, pretty much injury free for the last 18 months so I just try to keep the body on the field and, and keep trucking really so thanks for having me on best of luck hey hope you enjoyed that latest offering from Off The Ball if you want to subscribe and you should check out just up here all our latest stuff is just down here generally knock yourself out